Okay, so let's continue from where we left. Let's continue from where we left last time. We were discussing the topic of accounting for pension. That's what we were discussing last time. That's what we were discussing last time. And we had said, or we had done some part of the topic. We had done part of the topic. That's what we want to continue now with. That's what we want to continue with. So let me continue. This is what we had just said, just to remind you where we started. We were discussing this topic called accounting for pensions. And you remember we started by defining what is a pension scheme. So we defined what's a pension scheme. We don't have to go back. I'm just reminding you what the key things we did. What is a pension scheme or what is a pension fund? After we defined what's a pension scheme or a pension fund, we went on and talked about how does a pension scheme operate? How does a pension scheme operate? Where I told you, in a pension scheme, you can see we said contributions are normally made into a fund. Contributions are normally made into a fund. Then we said those contributions are normally invested by the funding agent, whoever it is, the funding agent. Then we said it is the funding agent who pays the benefits to the employees when they retire. That is in essence how a pension scheme operates. Contributions are made. Those contributions are invested by the funding agent, which we said can be an insurance company or a trustee. And then we said it is that funding agent who pays the benefits to the employees when they retire. After we discuss that and more, of course, there's a lot we discussed there, just reminding you first in an overview, we went on and discussed the different types of pension plans. In other words, listen, in other words, we said, as a company, as a company, there are two ways in which you can go into this kind of arrangement where you keep contributing, they are invested, and then the benefits are paid at the date of retirement. We said there are two ways in which you can use as a company to go into this kind of arrangement. And one of them is what we were calling the defined contribution plan. We are just reminding ourselves what are the various types of plans, pension plans. And one of them we said is the defined contribution plan. And number two is what we call the defined benefit plan. Then I told you it is important to remember how to distinguish those two terms. Why? I told you most questions will normally ask you to distinguish these two terms. What's a defined contribution plan and what's a defined benefit plan? Good. Just to remind you very fast, just to remind you very fast, we said in a pension scheme, don't forget, we said contributions are made to where? To a fund. Those contributions we said are invested by whoever is the funding agent. Then it is the funding agent who pays the benefits to the employees when they retire. And so we say, if your company chooses to go into this arrangement using the first approach, which we have called the defined contribution plan, defined contribution plan, then this is what we say that in a defined contribution plan, the contributions that you as an employer, you make, the contributions you make into the fund, we said those contributions are defined. They are known in advance. But how much the benefits the employees will take home at the date of retirement, 10 years from now, 11, 20 years from now, we said those benefits are not defined. 
they are not known in advance. So we said in a defined contribution plan, the contributions are defined. The contributions are known in advance. Meaning, as an employer, you know your obligation either every month or every year. And we said, for example, you may agree or you may be contributing 2,000 every year or 2,000 every month into the fund. That means that contribution is known in advance. But how much will the employees take home at the date of retirement? We see the benefits are not what? They are not defined. They are not defined. Then we asked ourselves, what will influence the amount of the benefits that the employees will take home at the date of retirement? We said the amount of the benefit will depend on the performance of the investments in the fund. Don't forget we have said contributions are invested. And so we said if the investments perform well, if the investments perform well, then your benefits will be more at the date of retirement. Your benefits will be more at the date of retirement. And if the investments perform poorly, then we say the fund will pay less benefits, of course. That was the first approach of going into a pension scheme. Either as a company, we said you use what we are calling the defined contribution plan. Of course, we discussed that in details. The second one is what we were calling the defined benefit. The defined benefit plan. That's another way you can go into this kind of a pension scheme as an employer. And we said in a defined benefit plan, how much the employees will take home at the date of retirement their benefits, those benefits are defined. The benefits are defined, meaning they are known in advance. Could be, as a company, you want your employees to take home one million shillings each at the date of retirement, 10 years, 20 years from now. So that means the benefit is defined. But then we see the contributions in a defined benefit plan, the contributions we said are not defined. The contributions are not defined. Then we asked ourselves, as an employer, how much should I be contributing into this fund in order to create fund of 1 million. We said it is at this point in time that you as a company you will need the services of the actuaries or what we were calling actuaries. You will call them and ask them please calculate for me how much I should be contributing in order to create a fund of 1 million shillings 10 years from now. So you as an employer and the actuaries we said, you will sit down and come up with the assumption of the scheme that you want to develop. We said one of the assumptions, of course we gave many, but for now I just want to use one. One of the assumptions we said is that you will have to ask yourself, how much are we expecting to be the market rate of return. What is the market rate of return? Could be, as a company, we project that the rate of return in the market will be 10%. So with that then, the actuaries will calculate and see that if, for example, if you contribute maybe 2,000 shillings, earning a 10%, that will create a fund of 1 million 10 years from now, that's what they will ask, calculate. They may tell you, for you to create a fund of 1 million 10 years from now, earning a 10%, please contribute 
2000. Then we went further and said, what if it happens that after two or three years, you have been contributing 2000, 2000, 2000, 2000 in the scheme. But after two years, now your return in the market is no longer 10% as per the projections. But we said, what if the market rate of return becomes 8%? If it becomes 8%, then if you as an employer, you continue contributing 2,000, now earning 12, 10%, no, sorry, now earning 8% instead of 10, will your fund be able to pay the benefits of 1 million? We said no. In other words, we said your fund will have what we were calling what? A deficit. Because we projected to be earning 10%. The calculation says contribute 2,000. Now we are earning 8%. It means the fund will not have sufficient funds to pay for the benefit, meaning it will have a deficit. And in that case, we said, to correct for that scenario, then the employer will be told to bring in additional the employer will be told to bring in additional contributions into the fund so as to make up for the expected shortfall. That's why we are saying that in a defined benefit plan, the contributions are not defined. They are not known in advance. You may be required to bring in more. Then we went further and said, what if you expected to earn at 10%, but now you're no longer earning at 10%. Two years down the line, you are now earning 12%. The rate of return in the market is 12%. So if you agreed with the actuaries that will be contributing 2,000, now we are not earning 10% as per the projection, but now we are earning 12%. Then I told you, if we continue contributing 2,000, earning 12%, earning 12%, then this fund we said, we shall have a surplus. The fund will have more than sufficient funds to pay for the benefits. What do you do? We said, I don't want to ask you, but I hope you remember, to correct for that scenario, we said, don't want to ask you. We said, what will the employer be required to do? We said, the employer will be required to take what we were calling what? A contribution holiday. The employer will be told to take a contribution holiday. Meaning, meaning that the employer will be told to do what? To stop. To stop contributing for a short while. The employer will be told to stop contributing for a short while until we utilize the excess that was created in the fund. Once you utilize the surplus, then you can now continue to contribute. That's why, listen, that's why in a defined benefit plan, we said, in a defined benefit plan, we said the benefits are defined, fine, but the contributions are not defined. We said the contributions are a set at such an amount that is expected to earn enough return. The contributions are a set at such an amount that is expected to earn enough return to meet the obligation of paying the benefits. Okay, good. Then we went further and said, if it happens that the fund has insufficient fund, the employer will be told to bring in additional contribution. If the employer, uh, if the fund has more than enough, that means the assets in the fund are more than enough, then the employer will be told to take a contribution holiday. So those are two terms I told you, you need to remember how to distinguish them. Because more often, your examiner at this level will always ask you to distinguish those two terms. Good. After we had discussed those two terms, we went further and discussed what else. We discussed what we were calling types of benefits. Of course, here 
we don't need to go back into the details. Those ones were not hard to remember. What is a short-term benefit? What's a long-term benefit? What's a termination benefit? And what is a retirement benefit? Those ones we say it, they are not hard. You remember that? They are not hard. After that, now we went to what we were calling other terms used in pension. So this is where we were discussing and that's where we want to continue before we do a few calculations. That's where we want to continue. Now, because again, listen, because again today is a free class, today being a free class, let me talk to the new students, one or two things. Let me talk to them first, today being a free class. Now listen, please subscribe. I would ask you to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that whenever we post new videos to the YouTube, you will be notified. For you who is here and you have not subscribed, please click on that subscription button down there and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can even do it now as we are going on. You just click on that subscription button so that you will be notified whenever we post new videos in the YouTube channel. So please subscribe and you can even click that notification bell. You can click that notification bell. The other important thing the new students should know is this, listen, that sometimes you may be disconnected because of your Wi-Fi strength being weak at one time or the other. If you are disconnected from class because of your Wi-Fi strength being weak, how can you come back to class? Listen, you may try and click the disconnected video and it doesn't bring you back to class. There are other two ways of coming back to class. One, you can click on the refresh button. In other words, you refresh your page. Normally, from the page you are watching the video from, either on the top left or on the top right, there is always a refresh button. So you can click on that refresh button to refresh the page. That will bring you back to class. If your gadget does not have that refresh button, then you can go back to the group where you received the link and click on the link again and click on the link again. That's another way you can come back to class. Good. So I think I'm through for the information concerning that, especially to the new students, where we are appealing to anybody who has not subscribed, please subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you'll be notified anytime we post new videos. Okay? So click that subscription button and then you click the notification bell. Then I've also talked about how to come back to class in case you are disconnected. Good. So let me now talk about what we are calling other terms that are used in pension. Because once in a while, you may find the examiner giving you a theory question. Define the following terms, blah, 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 as used in accounting for pension. Maybe two marks, three marks, and so on. Good. Number one, we discussed it. I can see we have ticked it, but let me just repeat it. Number one is funding. I told you this. Let me use it here. I think it's here. Yes. What's funding? I told you, as an employer, every time you are sending contributions, Every time you are sending contributions to the fund or to whoever is the funding agent, what are you doing? Every time you are sending contributions to the fund, you as an employer, you are funding that fund. So we defined funding as the process of making contributions. It is the process of making contributions into the fund so that those funds or those contributions may be invested 
by the funding agent and then the funding agent will pay the benefits at the date of return, retirement. So that's the simple on how we defined funding. It is the process of making contributions into the fund so that those funds could be invested. And then the funding agent would pay the benefits to the employees when they retire. Good. That's one. The second term we talked about that you may be told to talk about is what we were calling a funded scheme. It was related to what we can call unfunded scheme. Good. Let me remind you. In fact, I can see it here. We say, let us assume your company A and you normally make your contributions to another company B, which is the funding agent. We said that company could be NSSF or maybe it's an insurance company that manages the pension fund for the company, no problem. Then it is this funding agent who will invest and then later pay the benefits to the employees when they retire. Listen, if your company follows this approach, where they make contributions to another, listen, to another external entity, and that entity will invest the contributions, then later pay the benefits to the employees when they retire, then that kind of arrangement, we said, is known as a funded scheme. So we said a funded scheme is an arrangement where contributions are made to an external entity. Then that external entity, whoever it is, we are assuming here it could be company B, it could be NHIF, NSSF, ah, not NHIF, NSSF, and any other funding company. They invest, then pay the benefits. That is what we said is a funded scheme. Then I told you, listen, there are some other companies whereby it's true. They also make contributions on behalf of their employees. But to those companies, they don't make those contributions to an external entity. No. But assuming you're a company A, and you know every month or every year you're supposed to contribute 2000 we say you as company A, you may keep the records by just doing the double entry. Every year you recognize an expense and at the same time you recognize a liability. Then when the time of payment comes, you will calculate this employee who is leaving, how much do we owe him? Then you as an employer, you calculate what you owe that employer, employee, then you pay him by debiting the liability and crediting bank. So you as a company A, listen, you are not making your contributions to an external entity, no. To an external entity, no. But we say those contributions are retained in the business. They are retained in the business, meaning as a company A, you have an opportunity to reinvest the contributions back into the business. So where your company chooses this arrangement, then we said that kind of a scheme is classified as unfunded scheme. Of course, they are rare, but that could also happen where contributions are not made to an external entity, but they are retained in the business, then I told you it is the employer, it is the employer who now pays the benefits to the employees when they retire. In the other approach, it was the funding agent who will pay the benefits to the employees when they retire. But in this other one, it is the employer who pays the benefits to the employees when they retire. Good. So that's all. That's all for the unfunded scheme. And I believe we wrote some notes. I want to believe that. 
I want to believe that we wrote some notes. Did we, by the way? Did we write the notes? I think so. Yes or no? Somebody to chat and say, did we summarize the notes for those three? I think we did. Somebody to chat and say yes or no? Did we write the summary notes for those three terms? What's the funding? The process of making contributions, blah, blah, blah. Unfunded. Yes, we did. Okay. On my side, it's okay. Unless on your side, that's what I told you, Gilbert. That's what I told you, Gilbert. That there are various ways of coming back to the class if you are disconnected. One, you can refresh your page. Because you are saying, the net is katikaring. But on my side, it is stable. Me, I can see it has not disturbed me. But I'm saying, if on your side is giving you a problem try and reconnect one by refreshing the page if that does not work or if you don't have a refresh button either on the top left or top right i told you go back to the group where the link was posted and click on the link and click on the link again that will bring you back to class good so let's continue now let's continue now, so somebody says we wrote some notes on those three terms. So let's now go to the fourth term now. Let's go to the fourth term. What is a current or what we call a present service cost? Let me discuss it first. Let me discuss it first. Listen, as a company, you have operated for many years, but all those years, you did not have a pension scheme for your employees. As an employer, I've said, you have operated for many years, but in all those years, you did not have a pension scheme for your employees. So assuming this year, 2022, let me assume our current year is 2022, this year, 2022, you started a pension scheme on behalf of your employees. You started a pension scheme on behalf of your employees. Listen to this. Then, every month the employees give you a service, you keep sending contributions for that service. Every month the employees give you a service, you keep sending contributions for that service. Now, those contributions you are making, listen, for services rendered after the scheme has already been initiated, those contributions, you will account for them in the books of 2022 as current or what we called present service cost. So these are contributions for services rendered after the scheme has been initiated. After the scheme has been initiated. So the contributions that you make for the services rendered after the scheme has been initiated, that kind of contribution is what we classify as a current or a present service cost. Now listen, I started by saying, you have operated your business for long. You didn't have a scheme. Suppose in the year 2022, you decided also, in this second, in same year, you decided also that you also want to make contributions for service the employees gave you in the year 2021 maybe for the year 2020 you are making those contributions in the year 2022 but for services rendered before the scheme was initiated so you as a company you will account for those contributions in the books of 2022 as past or what we call prior 
service cost. So these are contributions that are made for services rendered before the scheme was initiated. You had a scheme which you started this year. So every time the employees give you a service, you keep sending contributions to the agent. That kind of a contribution, we have called it a current service cost. I've also told you, if this year you decide as a company that there are some employees you had in the year 2021, that time you did not have a scheme, but you also want to contribute for that period when they gave you a service, but you are making the contributions in the year 2022, so you will account for that contribution as a past or a prior service cost. So we are saying these are contributions made for service rendered before the scheme was initiated, before the scheme was initiated. So let's put down those two terms. Let's put down those two terms. That is number four and number five now. Let's put down those two. Number four. We had already put down number three. Let's put down number four now. Number four, same IV. Current stroke present service cost. Current stroke present service cost. Current stroke present service cost. Then you say this. These are contributions made. These are contributions made for services rendered. These are contributions made for services rendered after a pension scheme has been initiated. These are contributions made for services rendered after the scheme, after a pension scheme has been initiated. Okay, Gilbert now says you're okay. Now you are saying it is stable. You just know when to refresh and when to come back. Whenever you are disconnected, just refresh the page. Gilbert is saying it's okay now. Good. So I was saying Current service costs are contributions made or services rendered after a pension scheme has been initiated. Number five. Number five. Past stroke prior service cost. Past stroke prior service cost. Past stroke prior service cost. Then you say this past stroke prior service cost. Say this. These are contributions made. These are contributions made for services rendered. These are contributions made for services rendered before for services rendered before the scheme was initiated. These are contributions made or services rendered before the scheme was initiated. Or services rendered before the scheme was initiated. These are contributions made for services rendered before the scheme was initiated. Good. So that's all for number four and five. They are not long. Number six. Number six, now I want you to be a bit careful now. That's a bit involving. Number five. Now let me talk about number six now. What is actual gain? What's actual loss? So let me take you back here. Let me take you back because I want to connect with what we have already said. Listen, I told you in a defined benefit. Listen in a defined benefit plan, I told you the benefits are defined. 
which we were assuming, suppose you want to take home, your employees take home 1 million shillings. Then I told you, how much should I be contributing into this fund in order to create a fund of 1 million? I told you, it is at this point in time that I require the services of the actuaries. I told you, we shall sit down with the actuaries and come up with the assumptions of the scheme that we want to develop. I told you, one of the assumptions we have to make is what are we expecting to be the rate of return in the market. We assumed 10%. With that now in mind, the actuary sat down and calculated and said, if I can contribute 2,000 shillings every month, expecting it to earn a return of 10%, that will create a fund of 1 million. That's what we said on how a defined benefit plan operates. Then I went further and told you, what if after two years, you realize that your fund is no longer earning 10% as per the projections, but now your fund is earning 8%. What will happen if you continue contributing 2,000? We said, if you continue contributing 2,000, then this fund will have a deficit. That means the fund will have insufficient funds to pay for the benefit. What will be required to correct all that? To correct that scenario, we said the employer will be told to bring in additional contribution so as to make up for the expected shortfall. And that's why we said contributions are not defined. Then we went further and said, what if your fund is no longer earning 10%, but it's earning 12%. If as an employer, you continue contributing 2,000, now earning 12% instead of 10, what will happen? We said your fund will have a, what we call a surplus. That means your fund will be larger than expected. What did we say to correct that scenario you do? To correct for that scenario, we said the employer will be required to take what we call a contribution holiday. Meaning, we have just said, let the employer stop contributing for a short while. Good. So that was the operation of a defined benefit plan. Now listen. If you projected to be earning 10% and your fund Listen to this now. If you projected to be earning 10% and your fund now is earning 12%, then we say your fund will have what we call an actual gain. In other words, an actual gain will occur when the actual earnings, the actual earnings in the fund exceed the projected earnings. When your actual earnings in the fund exceed the projected earnings, then that gives rise to what we call an actual gain. But if your actual earnings now are 8%, while you, you projected that your fund will be earning 10%, then when the actual earnings in the fund are less than the projected earnings, then that gives rise to what we call an actual loss. So when you are told to define what is an actual gain, it is a scenario that takes place where the actual earnings in the fund exceed the projected earnings. 
where the actual earnings in the fund exceed the projected earnings, then that gives rise to what we call an actual gain. An actual loss occurs when the actual earnings in the fund are less than the projected earnings. The actual earnings in the fund are less than the projected earnings. That gives rise to what we call actual loss. Good. Now, I want to take you back to the next one because it's related again. The next term we want to talk about now is what we call experience surplus and what we are also calling experience deficit. Let me take you to the same chart. Now, in a defined benefit plan, to Mesema, in a defined benefit plan, the benefits are defined. They are known in advance. But the contributions are not defined. Listen to this. If you as a company, you want to know this fund of ours, will it be able to meet Will it be able to meet our obligation of paying the benefits? This is the obligation to pay one million. Will our fund be able to pay that one million? To know whether your fund is able to pay the one million or not, listen, you compare the assets of the fund with now the liabilities of the fund. I've already told you, the liability is that one million obligation to be paid 10 years from now. Are we able to pay that 10 million 10 years from now? 1 million 10 years from now? Compare the assets of the fund. Listen, of course you know, every time you send contributions to the fund, those contributions are invested. So all the investments in this fund are, of course, the assets of the fund. So, I want to know, are we able to meet our obligation of paying the benefits or not? So, I compare the assets of the fund with the liabilities of the fund. Listen to this now. If, if the assets of the fund exceed, if the assets of the fund exceed the liabilities of the fund, then we say your fund will have an experience surplus. It will have an experience surplus. If the assets of the fund are more than the liabilities, then the fund is said to have an experience surplus. And if the assets of the fund now are less than the liabilities of the fund, then we say your fund has an experience deficit. So when you are told to define what is an experience surplus and what is an experience deficit, then we are saying, listen now, an experience surplus occurs where the fund's assets, the fund's assets, where the fund's assets are more, where the fund's assets are more than the fund's liabilities, that gives rise to an actual, no, that gives rise to an experience surplus. Where the assets of the fund are more than the liabilities of the fund, that gives rise to what we are calling an experience surplus. An experience deficit occurs when the assets of the fund are less than the liabilities of the fund. That will give rise to what we are calling an experience deficit. Good. Now, listen, 
actual gains and experience surplus and whatever, they all come in. I want you to get the difference here now. Experience surplus, experience deficit, actual gains, actual losses, listen, they come up in because of the same effect. I contribute 2,000, listen, projecting that it will earn 10%. But it ends up earning 8%. What will happen to the fund? The fund will have insufficient funds. That means it will have a deficit. If I contribute 2000, projecting that it will earn 10%, it's now earning 12. Your fund will have a surplus. That is the effect. You can also look at this this way I contribute 2000 expecting to earn 10%, now it's earning 8%. The fund will have an actual loss. I contribute 2,000, expecting it to earn 10%, now it's earning 12%. The fund will have what we call an actual gain. But what is important is this. Listen, when you are taught to this about what's an experience surplus or deficit and what's an experience though what's an actual gain or loss i hope you have noticed when i was discussing them listen when you're told to talk about actual gain or losses listen i am not comparing the assets and the liabilities of the fund when i'm told to talk about actual gain or losses I am not comparing the assets and the liabilities of the fund. No. I am comparing the actual earnings and the projected earnings of the fund. I've told you actual gains occur where the actual earnings exceed the projected earnings. Of course, it will give rise to a surplus, but now we are saying it's giving rise to what we call actual gain i've told you actual losses occur where the actual earnings in the fund is less than the projected earnings that gives rise to what we call an actual loss listen so when you are told to talk about actual gains or losses listen you look at the fund listen you look at the fund from the point of view of its earnings. You look at the fund from the point of view of its earnings. But when you are told to talk about experience surplus and experience deficit, you look at the fund from the point of its assets and liabilities. I hope you are getting the point. I've told you, if the assets of the fund are more than the liabilities of the fund that gives rise to an experience surplus. I've also told you where the assets of the fund are less than the liabilities of the fund that gives rise to what we call an experience deficit. So I'm hoping you have got the distinction there that though the effect in the scheme is the same, but in terms of definition, when you're talking about actual gain or loss, look at it from the point of view of the earnings in the fund. When you're talking about experience surplus or deficit, look at it from the point of view of the assets and liabilities. Good. Now, let's talk about the last term. There was that last time before we put down the notes. The last one is what we are calling experience adjustments. Experience adjustments. Listen. From the term experience adjustments. Adjustments. You should be able to say something. Listen. We have already agreed a short while ago 
that if I was projecting to earn 10%, and now my fund is earning 8%, our fund will have a deficit. Then I asked you, how do we correct for that scenario? We said, the employer will be required to do what? To bring in additional contribution. The employer will be required to bring in additional contribution. Then I told you, what if you projected to earn 10%, but now you are earning 12%? Meaning your fund as a surplus. What shall we do to correct for that scenario? We said the employer will be required to take a contribution holiday. The employer will be required to take a contribution holiday. They need to stop contributing for a short while. Listen. So adjustments, experience adjustments are those adjustments that are made in a fund to correct those adjustments that are made in a fund to correct either an experience surplus or an experience deficit those adjustments are what we are calling experience adjustments of course to correct an experience surplus the employer will be told to do what bring in additional contribution Correct an experience surplus, which is an adjustment. The employer will be told to take a contribution holiday. Are you there? Good. So those are the terms. So let's put down the last three terms. Let's put down the last three terms now. We are at number six now. We are at number six now. So we are at number six down this number six actual gain or losses actual gains or losses actual gain or losses then you say this actuaries down this actuaries deal Actuaries deal with several uncertainties. Actuaries, or you call them actuaries, whatever you want to call them. Actuaries deal with several uncertainties when estimating, when estimating the cost of a pension scheme. Actuaries deal with several uncertainties when estimating the cost of a pension scheme. Will it stop? In resolving, continue, in resolving these uncertainties, in resolving these uncertainties, comma, they usually make assumptions. In resolving these uncertainties, they usually make assumptions. Please stop. Continue. Assumptions are made. Assumptions are made. Assumptions are made on areas such as Assumptions are made on areas such as market interest rate. Assumptions are made on areas such as market interest rate, comma, market interest rate, comma, salary increments in the future. Salary increments in the future. Retirement debt. Retirement debt. Comma. Workers turnover rate. Workers turnover rate. 
etc. Workers turn over it, etc. Will you stop? Continue. Another paragraph. Rarely, rarely do, rarely do the projected results, rarely do the projected results coincide, rarely do the projected results coincide with the actual results, rarely do the projected results coincide with the actual results, comma, therefore, or thereby giving rise to, thereby giving rise to, thereby giving rise to actual gains or losses, thereby giving rise to actual gains or losses thereby giving rise to actual gains or losses. Another paragraph. Another paragraph. Actual gains, actual gains occur. Actual gains occur where the actual earnings Actual gains occur where the actual earnings in the fund. Actual gains occur where the actual earnings in the fund exceed the projected earnings. Actual gains occur where the actual earnings in the fund exceed the projected earnings. Another paragraph. Actual losses occur. Actual losses occur. Actual losses occur where the actual earnings in the fund. Actual losses occur where the actual earnings in the fund are less than the projected earnings. Actual losses occur where the actual earnings in the fund are less than the projected earnings. Are less than the projected earnings. Good. So we have defined what's an actual gain. It occurs when the actual earnings in the fund exceed the projected earnings. What's an actual loss? It occurs when the actual earnings in the fund are less than the projected earnings. Let's go to number seven now. Let's go to number seven. Experience surplus stroke deficit. Experience surplus stroke deficit. Experience surplus stroke deficit. Experience surplus stroke deficit. Then you say this. So maybe in determining whether, in determining whether a fund, in determining whether a fund is able. In determining whether a fund is able to meet, in determining whether a fund is able to meet its obligation, in determining whether a fund is able to meet its obligation of paying the benefits, in determining whether a fund is able to meet its obligation of paying the benefits, Comma. The funds with an apostrophe, the funds assets, the funds assets are compared. The funds assets are compared 
with the funds again with an apostrophe the funds assets are compared with the funds liabilities the funds assets are compared with the funds liabilities another paragraph experience surplus experience surplus occurs experience surplus occurs where experience surplus occurs where the funds assets where the funds assets exceed where the funds assets exceed the funds liabilities experience surplus occurs where the funds assets exceed the funds liabilities experience surplus occurs where the funds assets exceed the funds liabilities Another paragraph. Another paragraph. Experience deficit. Experience deficit occurs. Experience deficit occurs when the funds assets, when the funds assets are less than the funds liabilities experience deficit occurs when the funds assets are less than the funds liabilities when the funds assets are less than the funds liabilities good so that's all for number seven we go to the last one number eight experience adjustments experience adjustments number eight experience adjustments experience adjustments experience adjustments and you say this these are adjustments these are adjustments made these are adjustments made these are adjustments made in a fund these are adjustments made in a fund to correct either these are adjustments made in a fund to correct either an experience surplus or deficit these are adjustments made in a fund to correct either an experience surplus or deficit or deficit another paragraph another paragraph to correct an experience surplus to correct an experience surplus to correct an experience surplus the employer to correct an experience surplus the employer may be allowed to correct an experience surplus the employer may be allowed to take the employer may be allowed to take a contribution holiday the employer may be allowed to take a contribution holiday the employer may be allowed to take a contribution holiday i.e i.e stop contributing 
for a short while, i.e. stop contributing for a short while, i.e. stop contributing for a short while. i.e. stop contributing for a short while. Another paragraph. To correct an experience deficit, to correct an experience deficit, to correct an experience deficit, the employer may be required, the employer may be required the employer may be required to make the employer may be required to make additional contributions the employer may be required to make additional contributions into the fund the employer may be required to make additional contributions into the fund so as to make up the employer may be required to make additional contributions into the fund so as to make up for the expected shortfall. So as to make up for the expected shortfall. The employer may be required to make additional contributions into the fund so as to make up for the expected shortfall. The employer may be required to make additional contributions into the fund so as to make up for the expected shortfall. Good. So we are through with the theory part of the topic. We are through with the theory part. Now we want to do a few calculations now. Let me take you through. Listen. Now we want to do some calculation. We have already talked about how a pension scheme operates. Empl contributions are made to a fund. Last time I told you this fund could be an insurance company or it could be a trustee. This fund could be an insurance company or a trustee. Now listen. This funding agent, which final accounts does he keep? Which final accounts does he keep? Those are the accounts we want to talk about now. The, fund, the final accounts of a funding agent. Let me go through them. One of the final accounts that a funding agent would normally keep is an account we shall be calling statement of changes in net assets. Statement of changes in net assets. Now, in a business, in a business, this is what you could call your income statement or profit and loss. So, in other words, a funding agent would want to know what's the profit for the year. But they don't call it PL account. No, they call it statement of changes in net assets. It is also known as, some books will call it fund account. That's another name. Now, don't write. So, how do they determine the profit? To get the profit, they'll find out what are the incomes of the fund. They will identify the incomes of the fund. Whatever the incomes, we shall talk about that in a short while. Get the totals. Then, come and minus all the expenditures of the fund. Whatever they are, minus. Then the difference between the incomes and expenditures, listen, now, in a normal business, you will call it either profit or loss. But for the funding agent, they don't call it profit or loss. They call it either surplus or a deficit. Good. So the difference here will either be a surplus 
or deficit. Listen. You have done financial accounting in section one. You did the topic called non-profit making organizations. For them, they were also not preparing a profit or loss for non-profit making. They were making or preparing what we call statement of income and expenditure. Then for them again, they had to identify the incomes and minus the expenditures. Then again, they were remaining with either surplus or a deficit. The same concept. That is it. Now, before I talk about, before I talk about the components of each, before I talk about the components of each, now listen, what about balance sheets? They don't again call it balance sheet. They call it statement of net assets. Statement of net assets. Now listen. Here the format is exactly the same like any other balance sheet that you know. The format is the same. Except that they don't call theirs capital like you do for business. I have just told you, non-profit making organizations also were not having the term called capital. Instead, they were having the term called accumulated fund. So in a normal business, you normally have capital. Then in the balance sheet, you come and add net profits. But for this kind of funding agent or for non-profit making organizations, you used to come and say accumulated fund then you come and add the surplus. If it was a deficit, you minus the deficit. So for balance sheet, it's exactly the same that you know, except for the capital. Now we go back to the income statement, which we are not calling it income statement. We are calling it statement of changes in net assets. So the question is, what are some of the sources of incomes for the funding agent? That's what we want to identify now. Listen, one major source of income for the funding agent, obvious, is the contributions they are receiving. Those contributions they are receiving is a major source of income. Now listen, contributions, when I started the topic, I told you, how does a pension scheme operate? I told you the employer and possibly the employee, the employer and possibly the employee make a regular contribution to the fund. Listen, so these contributions could be from the employer, whatever it is, or it could also be from the employee. Maybe you are required to make contribute also part of your salary. Good, maybe 2%, 1%, whatever it is, as per the rules. Now listen, there could be other employees who decide, listen, that they want to take home more than what the company wants them to take home. So instead of contributing maybe 2% of their salary as per the requirement, this employee decides to contribute more and above the legal requirement. That extra is contributing to the fund. We normally call it voluntary contribution. We call it voluntary contribution. So the others are the mandatory as per the law. The employer contributes this, you contribute this. But if you as an employee you want to take home more at the date of retirement and you want to contribute more, you are allowed. So that's what we call voluntary contribution. Good. So that's one major source of income. The other source of income for the funding agent, I told you, once he receives these contributions, what does he do with them? He will invest them. So another source of income is what we are calling investment income. 
this investment income could be in terms of dividends received if they bought shares in a company or they could have bought a building and therefore they are receiving what we are calling rental income or they could have invested by buying treasury bills or treasury bonds and therefore they are earning interest income so whichever source of income it is that is what we are calling investment income that's what we are calling investment income so that's another source of income for the funding agent and that is investment income another one as a funding agent or as a fund you may have decided to sell some of your investments maybe you sold some of your shares or you sold a building and so on and in the process you made a gain gain on sale of investments whatever it is that's what we are saying another source of income listen is where you as a funding agent you have investments either building or in shares somewhere and by the end of the year they have made a gain in terms of market value so maybe there is what we are calling gain on revaluation not gain on sale gain on revaluation of investments gain on revaluation of investments whatever it is that's another source of income good listen to the next one assuming you are a funding agent b agent a sorry an employee who was working with funding agent b an employee who was working with another funding agent in other words his contributions were being sent to that funding agent that employee got a job with another company this other company normally makes their contributions to funding agent a so this employee tells the funding agent b instead of giving me back my contributions please send it to funding agent a so that i continue from there so this funding agent a which we are assuming we are we are receiving some transfers from other schemes maybe an employee has joined our scheme and he instructed where he was originally that our their contributions to be sent to this scheme so that's another source of income for this funding agent that's what we shall call transfers from other schemes transfers from other schemes whatever it is so i've identified i have identified some of the sources of income for the funding agent good once you have through get the total then from there you now come and minus the expenditures now you less expenditure don't write let me first explain them you minus the expenditure one of the expenditures are the benefits that you paid this year some employees retired and you paid them their benefits that's an expenditure whatever it is good another expenditure of the funding agent could be the normal admin expenses they are also spending on electricity water telephone salaries and so on normal admin expenses next another expenditure could be loss on sale of investments loss on sale of investments whatever it is the other one could be loss on revaluation loss on revaluation of investments loss on revaluation of investments whatever it is again listen to this you are a company a funding agent a one of your employees now went to another company and that other company normally makes their contributions to funding b 
one of your employees, one of the employees who was contributing to us, now has gone to another scheme. He requires us to transfer their fund to that other scheme. So that's also an expenditure. You come and see your transfers to other schemes. Transfers to other schemes, whatever it is. Assuming those are the only ones, you get the net. Then you compare the incomes and expenditures. And that's what we have called either a surplus or a deficit. Either a surplus or a deficit. Good. So let's put down that format now. Let's put down that format. So Andika subheading, Andika a subheading, final accounts of a funding agent as a subtopic. Final accounts of a funding agent. Final accounts of a funding agent. Final accounts of a funding agent. Then you say this, number one. Number one, statement of changes in net assets. Statement of changes in net assets. In bracket. In bracket fund account statement of changes in net assets in bracket fund account then you see this below that this is the equivalent this is the equivalent of this is the equivalent of the profit and loss this is the equivalent of the profit and loss of a normal business this is the equivalent of the profit or loss of a normal business number two number two statement of net assets number two statement of net assets statement of net assets then you say this, this is the equivalent of a balance sheet. This is the equivalent of a balance sheet of a normal business. This is the equivalent of a balance sheet of a normal business. Good. Another paragraph. Another paragraph. The following is the format. The following is the format of the statement of changes in net assets. The following is the format of the statement of changes in net assets. The following is the format of the statement of changes in net assets. Good. So now you can copy this just to illustrate. We have just put in as much as we can but not all of them may be tested in a question no so have it statement of changes in net assets in bracket fund account then you come and identify the incomes you identify the incomes i've told you one of them is contributions contribution either from the employer employee or voluntary okay once you're through with that now you go to other sources of income one of them could be investment income investment income which we gave examples like dividend received rental income rental income interest received whatever else that's what we are classifying as investment income next gain or gain on sale of investments gain or gain on sale of investments gain on sale of investments 
Next, gain on revaluation of investments. Gain on revaluation of investments. Gain on revaluation of investments. Next, transfers from other schemes. Transfers from other schemes. Transfers from other schemes. Transfers from other schemes. Then you get the totals. Then you come and less. Once you get the totals, you less expenditure. One of the expenditures we are giving is benefits paid. Any benefits that were paid this year or pensions paid, what they call pension or benefits, whatever it is, that they are paying. Next could be admin expenses. Next could be loss on sale of investment. Next could be loss on revaluation of investments. Next could be transfers to other schemes. Transfers to other schemes. Then you will get the totals. Once you get the totals, you compare that with the net incomes up or due, and the difference is either surplus or deficit. It's either surplus or deficit. Good. With that idea now, I've told you the balance sheet doesn't, we don't have to put down the format is the same that way you know it. So with that idea now, let me project a question. Let me project a question. Listen, normally, Whatever questions the examiner will give you, they are normally easier. Except one which the examiner gave you. Most questions that have come in the past, you are just given a trial balance. Then from that trial balance of the funding agent, you are told to prepare either statement of changes in net assets or statement of net assets. That is it. But the question I want us to do is one which has some few adjustments additional information otherwise i'm saying most questions do come when you're only given a trial balance then from the trial balance you say this goes to this this goes to the income statement this goes to this this goes to the balance sheet that way that way that way and you prepare the balance sheet prepare the income statement and that's okay but the one i want us to do is one which had a few additional information meaning there were some adjustments to be done so it's an old question. So let me project it. Let me project it. We want to do it. Okay. So that is a question. It's a question that came in May, I think, no, December 2008. It's a question that came in December 2008. So let's read it. It says, number A, with reference to IS number 26, distinguish between defined contribution plan and defined benefit plan. I don't have to talk about them again. We have discussed them in details. Those two terms, you can see already, they have tested you in this question. My concern is part B. Nairo pension scheme is a private individual post-employment pension scheme. The following trial balance was extracted from the books of the scheme as at 31st of October 2008. You are given accumulated fund on 1st November 2007. If the current year is ending 2006, 2008, 2007 must be the beginning of the year. Then you are given investment in mortgage, that's an asset, Rental income, that's an income. Interest on fixed return securities, that's an income. Pension, that's amount paid. 11% treasury bond, that's an asset. Members contribution, administrative expenses, insurance expenses, dividend income, investment in unit trust, provident benefits paid, annuities benefits paid, 
cash and bank balance, let me roll the question. After cash and bank balance, what comes next? Uh, after cash and bank balance, we are given investment in quoted shares. Then you are given investment in unquoted shares. Then you are given individual transfers to and from other schemes. One amount on the debit, one amount on the credit. Additional information. This is where I was telling you most other questions don't have this. Interest, number one, interest income and members' contributions not yet received as the 31st of October 2008 amounted to 28.5 million and 168.3 million. Wamesema, interest income and members' contribution not yet received. So these are obvious. They are incomes we have already earned, but not yet received them. You know how to treat such incomes. Number two, pension benefits. Pension benefits claim not yet paid and outstanding administrative expenses as the 31st October 2008 amounted to 158 million and 1.5 million respectively. Obvious, these are accruals. And whenever you are preparing an income statement, any expense that is owing, you normally add. So we have not paid our claims. That's an expense, an expenditure which is owing. We have also admin expenses which are outstanding. They are owing. So we shall add. Good. Then you required. One, statement of changes in net assets. Number B, statement of net assets. Good. So let's do the question very fast now. We do the question very fast now. That's a question of December 208. December 208. So let's prepare the statement of changes. Statement of changes in net assets. Statement of changes in net assets. We have already agreed. You start with the incomes. Start with the incomes. The most common one we have agreed is the contribution. So maybe I can go through the trial balance. See where are we getting our contributions from. I think they just said members contribution. Let's check from this trial balance. Where did we see that amount? Let me roll the question. Okay. When I look at this trial balance, they have just given us one amount called members contribution. If you look at the column of the credit, it's given as 1505. Listen, that's what we have received. But if you remember, not number one told us, down there it says, interest income and members' contributions not yet received, not yet received, amounted to 28.5 and 168.3 million respectively. So here is an income you have already earned, but you have not yet received. I hope you still know when you are preparing income statement in accounting, we normally follow a concept called accrual concept, where we normally say you recognize costs when they're incurred, but not when money is paid. You also recognize revenue when it is earned, but not when money is received. So good. So we come and say, your members, according to the trial balance, what did we receive? Let's pick it from there. We received 15 or 5. 15 or 5. But there is a member's contribution which we have not received. According to the additional information number one, 
and they are saying it's how much interest and members' contributions not yet received. 28.5 in the interest, 163, 168.3 is the members' contributions. So we add that income which is owing, 168.3. So let's get the totals now. What is our true income for the year? What's our true income for the year? So I'm taking 15 or 5 plus 168.3. I'm getting a true amount income of 1,673.3. I hope I'm correct. Confirm my figures. Good. That's one source of income. Then we go to the trial balance again, looking for other sources of income. Listen, the rest now don't bother how much which one follows. You can start with any, but of course, major contribution is the major one. So let's go through the column. Listen, I'm going through the column of the credits. That's where the incomes are. And I want to identify the incomes from the credit column. I can see the first figure there is accumulated fund. That's not an income. The other figure I'm getting on the credit column is the rental income. That's another one. Good. So they are saying our rental income is a thousand. Is there any adjustments affecting it? Let me check the additional in terms of rental incomes. No, there is no adjustment affecting it. No. So we just pick rental income as a thousand. Put it rental income. One thousand. That one did not have an adjustment. I want to go back to the same trial balance looking for any other incomes. I've told you incomes are always a credit balance. But let's concentrate on the credit column. After rental income, I can see the next one up there is interest on fixed return securities. Interest on fixed return securities. 580. Then I ask myself, does it have an adjustment? From our fixed interest securities, we received an interest of 580. Note number one says, interest income received, interest income, and members' contributions not yet received, amounted to 28.5 and 168. So there's an income here which we have not received of 28. That is in form of interest income. So let's add the two. So come and see your interest income. From the trial balance, we have received how much? 580. Put it. From the additional, we are told there is another income we have not received. 28.5. We add. 28.5. So what is our true income? So this will be 580 plus 28.5. That gives me exactly 608.5. 608.5. Good. We go back to the same trial balance. We are looking for our incomes now. I am through with the interest income up there. The next item on the credit column is 1505. That's members' contribution. We have already used it. After members' contributions, I can see the next one is dividend income. Does it have an adjustment? No. So for dividend income, I just pick it as it is. 505. Bring it. Dividend income, 505. That one has no adjustment. We go back, find out any other source of income. I'm looking for the credit column. And the last one I can see there is 75. That's what they are calling transfers to and from 
transfers to and from other schemes. So our fund received another 75 from other schemes. Bring it to come and see your transfers from other schemes. Transfers from other schemes, 75. Good. I don't think I've left out any other source of income. I think from the trial balance, I'm through. And from the additional information, it's only not one that affected incomes. And we have dealt with those two from note number one. So we can now get the total incomes. Now we can get the total incomes now. So that we minus our expenditures now. This is 16, 73.3 plus a thousand plus 608.5 plus 505 plus 75 that gives me 38 61.8 i hope you are confirming my totals also good from there, we less now the expenditures. Sorry. We less the expenditure now. We less the expenditure. Let's go through the trial balance again. On the debit column, that's where the expenditures, we pick them. If they have an adjustment, we use it. Good. The same way we have done for the incomes. So let me roll the question. In terms of this trial balance on the debit, the first figure I can see there is 4,200. That's a mortgage, investment in mortgage, that's an asset. Pension, 390, that's pension, that's an expenditure. And of course, I read a note, 390, that's the expenditure. But if you look at note number two, I think so. 390 is the expenditure. But note number two say, pension benefit claims not yet paid and outstanding administrative expenses amounted to 158 and 1 1.5 million respectively. So we have paid benefits or pension amounting to 390. There is another 20, no, 158 we have not paid. Good. So we add the two. We just come and see your pension. 390 is what we have paid as per the trial balance. But according to the additional, we have not paid another 158. We have not paid 158. So what therefore becomes the total expenditure? So if I add the two, 390 plus 158, I'm getting 548. Good. 548. Let's go back to the same trial balance. We are picking our expenditures now. I am through with 390. That's an expenditure. The next one was treasury bond. That's an asset. Next one I can see is 150. That is administrative expense. That's an expenditure. And of course, you can see not two. You can see not two. Admin expenses were owing or outstanding by 1.5. So according to the trial balance, admin expenses are 150, but they are owing by 1.5. We add. So come and see your admin expenses as per the trial balance 150 plus 1 1.5 looks like 151.5 151.5 good next one after that we go to the next one after administrative expenses I can see the next one is insurance expenditure, uh, insurance expenses, 49. There was no adjustments anywhere that we read. 
affecting the insurance. So we pick it as it is. 49. Come and see your insurance. 49. After insurance, we go to the next one. Uh -huh. I'm still on the debit column. The other one is 1350. Your investment in unit trust. That's an asset. Next one is provident benefits paid for 16. That's an expenditure. Benefits paid. They are calling it provident benefits paid for 16. Put it. Provident benefits. Or 16. That one did not have any adjustment. No. Next one. After provident, I can see annuities benefits again. 15. Annuities benefits paid. There was no adjustment anywhere. We pick it. Annuities benefits. 15. Bring it. Annuity benefits. 15. After that, we go to the next one. After annuities benefits, the next one is cash. That's okay. That's an asset. Investments in quoted shares. That's an asset. Investment in unquoted shares. That's an asset. Then I can see finally, we have transfers to other schemes. That's an expenditure. Bring it. Transfers to other schemes transfers to other schemes and the amount I think was 5 let me confirm yes 5 so let's add now let's add now We get the total expenditures so that we prepare the balance sheet now. I am adding 548 plus 151.5 plus 49 plus 460 plus 15 plus 5. If I'm correct, you'll confirm. I'm getting 12 of 28.5. 12 of 28.5. Be confirming my figures. We want to compare that with the incomes. Our income on top there was 38. 61.5.8, sorry. I'm remaining with a net. I'm remaining with a net of 23, not 26. 33.3. And it looks a positive. The incomes were more than the expenditures. So we call it surplus. We call it surplus. Good. So let's now do the final balance sheet now. Let's do the final balance sheet. Let's do the balance sheet now. Hoping you are through with the copying. Now we want to prepare a statement of net assets. Statement of net assets. Of course, you start with the non-current assets. Those are the fixed assets. I read somewhere mortgage, investments, blah, blah, blah. Pick them. So let's go to the trial balance and pick those assets. Assets are a debit balance, so I just go to the trial balance and find the assets. Good. From this trial balance, we go through the trial balance, picking the assets now. From the top of the trial balance, I can see the first one is mortgage, investments in mortgage, 4,200. 
there was no adjustment affecting it. Bring it. Investment in mortgage. 4,200. There was no adjustment affecting it. Next. I go down. 11% treasury bonds. There was no adjustment. Bring it. 11% treasury bonds. It's an asset. I've forgotten the amount. Two thousand four hundred. Was there any adjustment? No. Two thousand four hundred. Good. Next one. I'm still on the asset. I'm going down. One fifty is an expenditure. Forty nine is an expenditure. Thirteen fifty is investments in unit trust. That's another asset. Bring it. Investment in unit trust. The amount we have seen is how much? 1350. Next one after investment in unit trust. I'm going down. Provident benefits that's an expenditure. Annuities benefits that's an expenditure. Cash and bank, that's a current asset. That one, we shall use it under current assets. Investments in quoted shares, that's an asset, fixed one. So investment in quoted shares, 1656. Would we'll bring it. Investment in quoted shares, 1656. 15 uh, 1656 next one after that we are still looking for other assets which are fixed next one i can see investment in unquoted shares that's a current a fixed asset also bring it 1200 investment in unquoted shares 1,200. I don't think I've left out any other fixed assets. No. Now we can come to current assets now. We can now come to current assets. Of course, you know, in this kind of fund, we don't have stocks. We have. Listen, we don't have stocks. But... If you read note number one, if you read note number one, note number one said, let's read it. Note number one said, interest income and members' contributions not yet received amounted to 28.5 and 168.3 respectively. So these are incomes we have already earned, but we have not yet received. So obvious, you consider them as assets. Like members' contributions, like a data. Interest we have already earned, but not yet received, that's an income. That's an asset also. Good. So bring them in now. Bring them in as part of current assets now. One of them is interest income owing 28.5. Put it interest income owing 28.5. The other one is what they have called members contributions due. There are some members who have not paid us. That's an asset. It's like a data. And the amount is how much? 168.3. Put it. 168.3. Good. Then we can now bring in the cash that I saw in the trial balance. Cash and bank or just cash. 
good. From the addition number one, we have picked number two, those who are liabilities. Pension benefits not paid and outstanding main expenses, those are liabilities. Otherwise, note number one was the assets. Then from there, I go back to the trauma balance. I think I saw cash and bank. Yes, cash and bank is 35. Bring it. Cash and bank, 35. I don't think I've left out any other asset. Maybe I can confirm from the trial balance. No. The only other current asset in the trial balance was cash. Otherwise, the other assets were all fixed assets. Good. Let's get the total assets now. We get the total assets now so that we go to what we can call equity and liabilities now. So we come to 4,200 plus. 2,400 plus 1,350 plus 1,656 plus 1,200 plus 28.5 plus 168.3 plus 35. In terms of assets, I am getting you will confirm my totals 11037.8 11037.8 that's what i'm getting now then we now can come and see equity and liabilities equity and liabilities for equity we start with what they have called accumulated fund i told you they don't call theirs capital they call it accumulated fund and according to the balance at uh, the trial balance sorry how much was the accumulated fund i think it was the first item in the trial balance yes it is 85 no 82 45 82 45 put it 8245 then i told you now add the surplus we have got a surplus in our income statement though we don't call it income statement we have called it statement of changes in net assets and i can see the surplus there is 2633.3 good 2633.3 I add those two, what do I get? 8245, 8245 plus 2633.3, I'm getting an amount of 10, 878.3. Good. Then we come now to liabilities. From this question, listen. We did not see any long-term liability like a loan, nothing. So we go to current liabilities now. For current liabilities, all of them are given as an additional. Note number two, you remember? Note number two, that's where the liabilities were. Let's go back to that note number two. Note number two said, pension benefits claim not yet paid and outstanding admin expenses amounted 158 and 1.5 respectively. So unpaid benefits are 158, put it. Come and see your unpaid benefits. Unpaid benefits, 158. Somebody could have also called them accrued benefits outstanding whatever term you use so long as you know their ability 158 then we have just read admin expenses owing or accrued admin expenses owing or you can call it accrued i think it was 1.5 let me see from note number one note number two yes 1.5 Let me confirm from the trial balance. Do we have any other liability? 
No. From this trial balance, I can't see any other liability, especially on the credit column. There are no liabilities. Good. So we can now get the total equity and liabilities to see whether it's agreeing with the assets now. So let's add 10, 8, 70, whatever, plus 158 plus 1.5. And I'm getting a total of 11, 0.37.8. Is it agreeing? Yes. Good. That is it for that. That is it for that. That brings me to the end of that question. That brings me to the end of that question now. So finish, I want to say one or two things. Finish, I want to say one or two things. Okay. So for the new students who are here, I'm talking to you now. For the new students who are here, and maybe you would wish to continue with us, for the normal classes. Listen, you are doing financial reporting and you want to continue with us for the normal classes. Classes are every Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, like today. All classes are from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. So whoever is here and is doing FR, which is financial reporting for the intermediate, and you want to continue with us, you can See, that's the timings. Now listen. You may say that you are not available during this time. So you can also buy what we call, you can also buy what we call pre-recorded videos. You can also buy what we call pre-recorded videos, whereby you get the videos for the whole syllabus at once, and then you watch them at your own free time and at your own pace. Otherwise, if you want to join the normal class, it's Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. Listen, our system is such a way that in case you miss a class, assuming on a Friday you are working late, does it mean that you will miss the class on Friday? The answer is no. You can go back to the group where the link was posted and you click on the link and you'll be able to watch your video at your own free time so that's the good thing about the system in that in case you miss a class then don't panic just know that your class is waiting you can go back to the group where the link was posted click on the link and you'll be able to watch your video again maybe it's a class i've already taught you and you feel you want to listen to something that bypassed you, you want to listen to the class again just go back to the group, click on the link, and you'll be able to watch the video of the class that you want to watch as many times as possible. Good. We are charging 4,000 shillings. We are charging 4,000 shillings for the whole semester. Okay. And of course, we also accept, pay we also accept payments in installments. We also accept payments in installments. If you are interested, you can now call me on this number, 0722-658875. If you are interested, you can call me on that number, 0722-6588. Of course, if you join today, listen, if you join today, we shall give you the classes of all the previous classes, the videos. We shall give you the videos of all the previous classes classes that you have already missed. Good. So I think that's all about financial reporting, that the classes are every Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. I've told you, in case you miss a class, you can still watch the video of the class that you missed. Just go back to the group. I've also told you, in case you are not available in any of the times, or for whatever reason, you can also buy what we call pre-recorded videos, pre-recorded videos. The charges are 4,000. We have said we accept payments in installments. My number is 0722-658875. Good. 
of course, I've told you, if you join today, you still can get or you will get the videos of the previous classes. Now, some of you are here and you are friends who are doing advanced financial reporting. We are also teaching it. Advanced financial reporting. For advanced financial reporting, we have either early morning or evening classes. Early morning, we have from 5.30 in the morning to 7 in the morning every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for early morning advanced financial reporting. Evening, again from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. every Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday. Again, if you miss a class for whatever reason, the same way for financial reporting, you can still go back and watch your video at any other time. Another point is you can still buy again the pre recorded videos for advanced financial reporting. You can still buy the pre recorded videos if you want to listen to the videos at your own free time, at your own pace. Good. I think again. Another area we are teaching is financial accounting. For those who are here and your friends who are doing financial accounting of the foundation level or what used to be called section one, that also we are teaching. Also the FA of what we call ATD1 and ATD2. If you have friends who are doing them, then you can recommend them that we are also teaching. So in other words, we are teaching the accounting papers across CPA. Good. So my number is 0722 So If you are here and you're interested, you're interested in taking financial reporting, call me even after this or tomorrow, no problem. We talk about how you can get the previous videos and how you want to pay. Okay? Otherwise, good night. See you next time. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. I don't know whether we have any visitor who would want to say something. Any visitor would want to say something. You can chat. Any visitor would want to say something. Good night, Mary. Uh huh. Good night. Okay. Bye now. So unless there is no other comment, maybe especially from the visitors. Otherwise, good night for now. Good night. Okay. So let me close the class. It seems there is no other comment. Let me close the class now.